Hello, welcome to episode two of the Modern Game Tutorial series. Today, we're going to be introducing and implementing the concept of a sprite. So what is a sprite? Um, in its simplest form, a sprite is an image and a position. You can add a ton of other attributes to it, but that's pretty much the simplest form. So why would you want to use a sprite? Well, a sprite is just one way of organizing your code to make it uh, easier and more scalable to make games. Um, if you're coming from something like Unity, uh, you're probably familiar with the ECS architecture, which is the Entity Component System architecture, where you'll have a game object um, that's just an ID, and it, you can then attach on components, like you'll have an image component, um, a transform component, uh, all that sort of stuff. A different approach, and an approach that is more typical with frameworks like Monogame, is an object-oriented approach. And while it isn't required, it is very popular and it is also a good skill to learn if you want to get into game development. The object-oriented approach goes something like this. You have a base class that's a sprite and it typically just has an image and a position. Um, and then you have you inherit from that class and have, for example, an enemy class. This class then inherits the image and position, but it also has things like um, attack power, stuff like that. Then you inherit it. Uh, you inherit from the uh, sprite class and create something like a player class. This player class inherits the image and position as well. Then we add on the health, the attack power, and we add on the ability to move around. So uh, as you can see with this object-oriented approach, it can make it a little more simple. We're sort of like modul modulizing and sorting our code into different sort of blocks here. Um, it is a little bit difficult to get your head around if you're coming into it completely brand new to object oriented programming. However, it should make sense after a little bit. So let's get into it. So the first thing you want to do is create a new file. So I'm going to right click on our project and add a new item. I'm going to call it sprite.cs. So how do we create a sprite? So we're going to go inside this class and we're making a new class here. It needs two things, an image and a position. So let's go ahead and do that. Public texture 2D. Um, and I'm going to do texture and let's just create a public vector 2D or vector 2 um, position. Make sure you're using the Microsoft XNA framework one, not the system numerics one. Okay, now we just need a constructor for our class to use them. So I'm just going to create a public sprite, throw that in there. IntelliSense is awesome. That is our class. Um, so this is the bare minimum pretty much for a sprite. Let's go back to our game1.cs and use it. Uh, so the first thing is we're going to have to um, actually make a sprite object that is accessible inside of our uh, uh, methods here. So I'm going to create a member field and I'm going to just call it sprite sprite. Um, so I'm leaving it uninitialized because we do that inside of one of these methods. Which one you use it in is up to you. I typically do it actually in the load content. And the reason is because whenever I'm creating a sprite, I'm also loading in a texture. So I want to do that in the load content here. Um, so I'm going to do a sprite, which I'm accessing that member variable equals a new sprite object. And here we need that texture in that position. So let's go ahead and uh, solve those problems. For the texture, I'm going to create a texture 2D object here. And I'm just going to call it texture and just do the exact same thing we did before. So content.load and player static. And you'll notice that I'm creating it locally scoped to this load content, basically meaning that we can't use it like, let's say, an update. It can only work inside this content here. And the reason is because as soon as we um, inject it into this uh, into the sprite classes constructor, we now have access to this texture. So it's um, it's very, very beneficial to do something like this because we don't have to, for example, uh, put an uninitialized texture 2D here every time that we want to create another texture. Instead, we can just do them all here and do our stuff like that. It makes a, a lot more clean. Next thing is the position. So I'm just going to do a vector 2.0. Boom. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Now we want to use it. So let's just go ahead and do that the same way we did before. Have a sprite batch begin and end. So sprite batch dot begin. And I need the sampler state because I'm using pixel art. So sampler state dot point clamp. And then we need to do an end, so sprite batch dot ends, same deal. And we want to draw it, so we just do an underscore sprite batch uh, dot draw. Okay, and now we just need a sprite dot texture um, and sprite dot position, and then sprite dot, oh, we don't actually have that, and then just color dot white. So this is pretty clean. We're able to access the uh, public member fields of our sprite object um, by using the dot operator, and it makes it really, really, it, it, it reads like English. We're, we're, 
using the sprite and we're accessing the texture, we're using the sprite's position, um, it's a lot better than just having some arbitrary texture value and some arbitrary position value and wrapping it together in some other way. So you can see why the object-oriented approach can be pretty popular. Now when I run it, there's nothing you know special and fancy that happens. I have a very, very tiny sprite because it's only 4 by 8 pixels, uh, but it works. Let's solve that, that scaling problem. Let's add an attribute to our sprite. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm actually going to uh, override it. Now you could just add this into the base sprite, but I'm going to actually create a new file and I'm just going to call this one scaled sprite. Okay, and now scaled sprite is going to inherit from sprite. So I'm just going to um, do this to the inheritance. And the way you do the way you inherit from another class um, in C sharp is you go to wherever the name of your new class is space colon space and then just the name of your class here. Now you're gonna see an error, it's gonna blow up in your face. There's no argument given that corresponds to the required parameter of texture um, and all that other stuff. Basically what it means is we need a constructor that satisfies our uh, base class. So we're gonna do a public scaled sprite and remember that we need a texture and a position for our uh, class to work. So now we need our vector two, make sure we're using the Microsoft framework one um, and then position. And then we can do a really um, interesting syntax thing here. We can do a base call. And this is basically just um, calling our base constructor. And then we can do just texture and position. And this is really long winded and also it needs to be 2D. Um, but it's basically saying we're whenever we create a new scaled sprite, we are injecting the values of texture and position into um, our basis constructor. And then we're going to use our um, new overrided constructor here, our new our new top layer constructor. Okay, so now we need a scalar sprite. Let's actually do something like relevant to Monogame. We're going to, the first method is using a rectangle. Um, and the rectangle just has an X and a Y, a width and a height. Um, so for this, I'm going to actually create a property and I'll explain why in a bit. So I'm gonna create a public rectangle, make sure we're using the Microsoft XNA one, uh, rect with a capital R for the convention of a property. And then I'm just going to create only a getter, not a setter. So get, and then in the curly brackets, cause it's a custom getter, we're going to return a new rectangle. And here is where the magic happens. So for the position, we already have a position uh, variable here. So why don't we why don't we just use it? I'm just going to um, use the position variable. We do have to typecast it to an int because rectangles store ints for the uh, the values. It's going to be an int position, and then an int or it's position dot x, and then an int uh, position dot y. And then for the width and the height, I'm just going to throw in like 100, 200. Why not? That will change, of course, in the future. So boom, we now have our rect, pretty cool stuff, awesome stuff. We don't even actually have to do anything new inside of our uh, new constructor, which is pretty cool. Okay, so let's go ahead and make a scaled sprite. I'm just going to change this declaration to scaled sprite. And since we don't need any new arguments to our constructor, um, it should be fine. All we have to do is change the, whenever we create a new one, we have to do a new scaled sprite. Now everything else should work. Um, but to actually see the effects, the fruits of our labor, we change the sprite.position to sprite.rect. And what you'll see is that it doesn't uh, complain because if we hover over draw, there are seven overloads of draw and one of them happens to be sprite.texture, sprite.rect, and color.white. Very cool. Now we can run it and boom, we have our sprite drawn right here. Very cool stuff. All right, so now we can uh, show another example of how you want to use your sprite. But first I'm gonna explain that um, whole property thing. If you already know that, just skip ahead. So the reason that we use an act a property for rect instead of just a regular variable is because rect is dependent on position. So remember that the rect stores the position and the size of the sprite. So let's say that we did have a regular variable for rect like this. Um, so why why didn't we just do a regular variable? Well, let's say we did this. We initialized rect here, and then we just did position dot x plus equals one. What now happened to this rect position? Uh, nothing happened because we didn't touch it. Now the x attribute of our rect is inaccurate. It's just not where it should be. So to solve this, we used a property that is dependent on our position. So it will always grab the proper position whenever we need to use this rect. Pretty cool stuff. All right, now let's make another sprite variant. I'm gonna make this one colored sprite. So I'm gonna add a new item and it's going to be a colored sprite. Now we can pick, do we wanna inherit from the scaled sprite or do we wanna inherit from the sprite? Um, I think the scaled sprite would be easier to see what we're doing. So I'm gonna inherit from the scaled sprite. 
And again, we have another complaint. So I'm just going to do the exact same thing as before. But this one, we do actually want to do something new in our constructor. We're going to have a color attribute. So I'm going to do uh, color. I'm going to make a member field here. I'm going to make it public, public, color, color. And then I'm going to take in an additional argument. So I'm going to take in a new argument, color, color, and then this dot color equals color. Awesome stuff. Now we have another argument for our constructor. We can do a cool little change here. I'm going to do a colored sprite and then do another color sprite here, color dot red. And then we can just change it here to sprite dot color. Now, if we run this, we'll see that our sprite is blended with the red color because we now have our colored sprite. Pretty cool stuff. So you could see how you could, for example, like store a bunch of colored sprites and then just have this sort of uh, blueprint for it that makes it a lot simpler to draw those. Very cool stuff. Let's actually show some stuff, some, some of this in action here. So I'm going to create another one. I'm just going to kind of breeze through it here. I'm going to create um, a moving sprite. And this moving sprite is going to inherit from our uh, scale sprite because we don't really need the color that much, honestly. We're going to have a private float speed and then we're going to have a float speed here um, and then we're going to have a speed equal or this dot speed equals speed and then we're going to have one more thing instead of our um, sprite here our original sprite.cs i'm going to add a method i'm going to call this a public virtual void update the reason we're making it virtual is because we want this to be overrided Right now, we're not going to do anything in our regular sprite because remember, a sprite only has an image and a position. But in our moving sprite, we want something to happen. So we're going to do a public override void update. And here, we are going to actually do something. So I'm going to do position, oops, dot x plus equals speed. All right, bam, we got some functionality going on here. I'm going to make this one now a, uh, a moving sprite. And instead of doing this color here, I'm going to set the speed to 1F, moving sprite, whoops, a new moving sprite. And now to actually do this, we're going to go into our update here and I'm gonna do sprite.update. Bam, awesome. And here we're going to change this to just color.white because we're not using a um, colored sprite. And run it, and boom, our sprite is moving across the screen. Let's make a ton of them. I'm going to, instead of doing this, I'm going to create a uh, list of sprites. So a list of moving sprites. And I'm just going to say this is our sprites list. And here I'm going to do uh, sprites equals a new list of moving sprites. And now I'm just going to inject 10, I guess. So let's just do four int i equals zero. i is less than 10 i plus plus. So we're looping over 10 times. And we're just going to do uh, sprites dot add a new sprite, a uh, new moving sprite. And again, we need the texture. So we're going to do the texture, we're going to do, um, I'm going to do a new vector two here, and just do zero. And then uh, let's say like 10 times i so that it's going by 10s. And then for the speed, I'm just going to set it to i. So basically, we're going to have sprites with speeds ranging from one to 10. Awesome. Now to update all of them, we're just going to do this. We're just going to do for each um, moving sprite, sprite, and sprites, sprite.update. This just loops over all of our sprites and our list of sprites and updates them. Now, again, here, inside of our sprite batch, we're going to do for each a moving sprite, sprite, and sprites. And then we're going to do uh, sprite batch dot draw. Um, and then we're going to do um, the sprite dot texture, the sprite dot rect, and then color dot white. So same thing as before, but we're now looping through a list of sprites. We're basically organizing it. And notice how we only have one member field, even though we have 10 sprites. This is one of the advantages of object-oriented programming. It makes it so you can organize your game objects pretty easily. So this should let us see 10 sprites moving on the screen at different speeds. Let's go ahead and run it. Bam, it's pretty trippy, but <laughs> yeah, we have 10 sprites moving at different speeds. And of course, one of them is at zero because uh, the for loop started at zero. So hopefully that made sense. I try to provide a ton of examples if you're new to object-oriented programming. Um, if you're not, I'm glad that you were able to stick through it. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And if you have any questions, make sure to join my Discord. I'll be answering a ton there. And consider supporting me on Patreon so I can continue making videos like this. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good day. See ya.